Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. We're having a Zoom invitation issue this evening that we're working through. Give it, give it us another minute for people to trickle in here. Frank, we all had the same issue, so I'm just waiting for everybody to get the invites and get into the meeting. Oh, good. It wasn't just me. <laughs> it was uh, a Zoom issue, but apparently I had to send it to everyone several times for it to actually go through. It was so weird. It appeared. I clicked on it. It disappeared. Just like that, as quick as you sent it. Very odd. See. All right. Well, I think we are three, five, seven. We're all here. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's get started. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, uh, board members, Frank, and our five attendees in the audience this evening to the DMS Board of Directors meeting, uh, better uh, officially legally known as the Valley of the Sun Waldorf Association Association. So uh, I'm going to read the opening verse and we'll get started. The true aim of education is to awaken the real powers of perception and judgment in relation to life and living, for only such an awakening can lead to true freedom. That's from Rudolf Steiner. And uh, Nelly, if you could be prepared to read the closing verse this evening so we can hear a new voice at the end of our meeting, I appreciate it. All right, uh, so I am Gregory Schneider. I'm the board president, and let's go around and introduce ourselves, starting with Dan. I'm Dan Franks, and I'm the board treasurer. Dan and April. April Sauer, board secretary. Thank you, Danielle. Hi, good evening, Danielle Martinez, board member. Kirsten. Kirsten Cabina, board member. Mr. Tanner. John Tanner, board member. And Nellie. Nellie Wilson-Walker, board member. And last but certainly not least, Frank. Hello everyone, Frank Marizio, executive director. All right. So we have a fair number of things to work through this evening, so let's jump right to it. Um, for those watching, uh, we're going to cover a student issue anonymously uh, to protect those students' rights. Uh, we're going to deal with a variety of budget and finance matters. Uh, we'll hear updates uh, from Frank about the end of the school year. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, whether or not we should be offering hybrid education next school year. Uh, and then we'll take care of some board business at the very end. So, uh, let's jump right to uh, the student issue. Uh, Frank, I believe you forwarded uh, information uh, from the, the rising fourth grade class teacher um, and about rising fourth grade students. Um, it, does it, it, to try and keep this as anonymous as possible, um, the basic issue is there is the Arizona has a law move on when reading and if you don't as a student score a passing score on that test then state law requires the student to be held back a year uh, so in other words repeat third grade unless um, you go through an appeal process and there's an exception made for that student under certain reasons um, so we as the board of directors are the panel that decides whether or not to grant that exception. Uh, I learned a couple, about a week ago uh, when Frank forwarded us this email. So uh, does anyone have questions about the information Frank sent? No, okay. 
Frank, is there anything else that you think we should consider that wasn't included in your email or the, the description you forwarded from the teacher? Yes, one thing that we didn't mention in the emails, I don't believe we made a big enough deal about it. This year being so odd with the, you're in school, you're back at home, you're hybrid, there is no doubt that had something to do with all students' um, achievement levels across the board. And I, I don't believe we made that big of a deal of it in the letters to you, but I do think that is an extra consideration in this situation. And I support what the reading specialist, Ms. Moriarty, and what the third grade teacher, Ms. Mikowski, are proposing that um, these two students meet enough of the criteria for us to say, let's move them on to fourth grade and monitor it to see if this happens again. All right, so anyone else, uh, questions or further discussion about this issue? No, okay. Well, in that case, I will move to permit the two students Mr. Maurizio has emailed us about to advance to the fourth grade. Second. Second. Uh, Danielle and John both second, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All, right. All those in favor? All right. That is unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you all. Okay, so that takes us into uh, financial and budgetary matters. Uh, first up on that is our 2021 to 2022 budget process. Frank, I know you're meeting with Monique tomorrow uh, to talk about some details about that. <clears throat> I was also asking our resident CPA, Kirsten, to take a look uh, at that. Uh, as well, and she, I know she had some questions, but I think it would probably be a more productive conversation offline. Um, so I was wondering, Frank, if she could get looped into your conversation with Monique, just to um, have a, another set of eyes on that. Of course. Um, Kirsten, are you available uh, between 12.30 and 1.30 tomorrow? I'm not available until one. I so have I could a, join a bit late. <laughs> I have an interview at 1.30 for a, a grades teacher who's Waldorf trained, so I don't want to put that off. Wow. That no, certainly not. To, that should go to about 2.30. Are you more available later in the day? I am. I can move some things around and be available at, um, at, at the end of that interview at 2.30 uh, for the rest two, of the day. 2.30 or 3.00 would probably be best. And if you okay. would just text me um, your phone number or email me your phone number in the morning so that I'll just call you and we'll talk in a three-way right there uh, with Monique, okay? That sounds great. Thanks, okay. Frank. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Perfect. Um, all right. So I, I don't know that there's that much more to say about it. There's uh, We're working on getting a draft that will be ready for the board to review and approve. Um, and then there's a specific process where we approve the draft, it gets posted online, and then we approve it again, uh, and then it gets submitted to the state. Um, but Frank is gonna hammer out the details of that tomorrow with Monique, who's very familiar with that process to make sure we have enough board meetings at the right time to actually get it approved in the proper way. Um, and for us to actually which review it substantively and uh, ask any questions about it. Uh, any questions about that process, anyone? No, okay. Moving right along. Uh, an enrollment update. Uh, where do things stand, Frank? Well, we're still at, if school starts on August, 11th, we have 301 students enrolled. I'm a little bit concerned about 
Um, the eighth grade and the seniors, there could be some uh, movement there. And so, as you know, the original budget numbers that Monique are working off of are 287, just in case we wanted to, we wanted to be very safe and uh, just cautious with the budget to not overspend. So that if we come in at 301 or 307 or 314, like we're hoping, that would all be extra on top of what our budget is. And it's always good to have a carryover anyway for things that could happen. Uh, as our, you and I had a small discussion today, Steve and Hector and I walked the campus today to do an inspection heading into the summer of the things that need um, some fixing, some attention. And I am worried about a couple of air conditioning units. I'm worried about a the fence line along the high school. I might have to address those things. So it might be nice if, uh, if we really do have 305 to 307 and I've budgeted for 287, I'll have some extra money there to work with. And then the other thing that um, the board may not recognize, the, the governor has not officially released a budget yet. <laughs> And this is getting late. Normally it's done in early May and, and school districts across the state plan on certain numbers. And we're getting a little concerned that that is not out yet. So we don't have any, you know, the last three years, he actually said, here's 5% to give your staff. Uh, he, it was actually 10%, 5% and 5%. We don't have anything like that this year. Um, so we are going off of there is no money coming. That doesn't mean there's not. We just don't have information that there is. So we have to be conservative in those situations. So we're waiting patiently on that. Uh, we have about 11, maybe 13 tours this week. And I think about six of them are high school, which is excellent because, as you know, that's where we have our most room is in the high school. And uh, even though we might lose some ninth graders and some 12th graders, we're still up, uh, I want to say, nine high schoolers for next year, but I'd like to be up 20, <laughs> to be quite honest. So we're working on that. Um, we'll know more by next board meeting for sure because of all of the tours that we're giving. Crystal's doing a great job doing that. And uh, I think we have two tours scheduled in the next two weeks. So we're doing group tours instead of one every other day. There's groups of nine and 11 on two different times, so. Excellent. It sounds like overall very good news. We are it is. In the right direction. So thank you for your continued efforts there. All right, next up, uh, we got an email from uh, Ms. Deb about the allocation of tax credits and how we're tracking those and whether or not they should be restricted and how that all works. Um, and I think what we should do it, and she suggested that this was a board decision, not an administrative decision, um, that, that we are supposed to decide something about how this works. Um, so I, I, I don't have the answers for you tonight. Um, but I think what we could use is somebody to take a look at this area. And does anybody have extensive familiarity with it off the top of their head? Obviously, I've done this a long time. And there was a day uh, that you could actually say, I'm Frank Marizio, and I want this to go to my daughter's choir program or my daughter's field trip. I don't know if that rule has changed. I absolutely know that used to be a true statement and people used to do that. I just don't know if that has changed recently. Um, but I do believe that that was factual some time ago. Okay. I'm happy to do some research on that. Okay, that, that'd be great, Danielle. Um, so if you can figure out you know, all the relevant pieces and if there are any legal parts of it, uh, you know, like a statute or something that governs, I think there might be. Um, 
about the tax credit contributions. Uh, you know, maybe you and I can take a look, Danielle, and if there's a tax kind of issue, Kirsten, would you be willing to take a look at it? Perfect. Danielle, could you ask a question? Um, Jessica has been asking me, and I'm not sure on this. We believe we found an answer, an answer, but we're not sure. If money is allowed to go to field trips, say the senior trip, and, and parents want to use tax credit money to the senior trip, the rule Jessica discovered was if a student couldn't afford it, and everyone else, 10 students were using it from tax credit money and student number 11 couldn't afford it and couldn't give tax credit money that the school had to pay for it. Um, we're a little concerned about that because some of our senior trips aren't four or $500, which wouldn't be the end of the world. Some of them are three and $4,000. <laughs> and that is problematic to come out of our budget that time of year because that's about the time we're dwindling down. And so we would like clarification if it can be used for senior trips and a kid can't afford it, does the district have to pay for it or does the student just not go because they couldn't afford it? We don't know Perfect. the answer on that. Sure. And we've done fundraising in the past. Would that not be able to be covered through fundraising efforts as well? Yes, yes, it would. Um, okay. The issue is, and if there is nothing there to be given, then is the, the school have to cover it? to pay for it? And a follow-up question, are we talking specifically tax credit? Or are we talking all donations or educational investment campaign? I think it's funds? tax credit. Yeah, it's tax credits. There's a, now that I'm, we're talking about it. There is a specific statute that tells you what you can do with them. So there's a certain, and it's a pretty broad list, but it's still a list of specific things. And what I haven't looked into is the ability of parents to actually allocate things to certain projects or uh, like Frank is saying that the school would have to cover something that some percentage of students were fully funded by tax credits and then there were a smaller percentage who just didn't have any funds for it. And let's say those are all possibilities. Do we have, does Aspire or Jessica have accounting methods to track and be able to report back to parents? Good question. I think that's something we should also ask. Frank, maybe you can ask. Yes, we do. We have an actual line in the budget for tax credits and we know where they came from. That's why I'm able to write thank you letters to parents who make donations because I can tell who they are and what they have said. And we also have a way of tracking if they're saying, I wanted to just stay with my student in the fourth grade, or this is for the general fund. Because typically we ask one of those things. Jessica just wants to make sure that the board is given direction on this uh, because she wants to do it correctly. Um, and so we just aren't sure anymore if that law still stands or if something changed in tax credit law. I'm on it. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, Danielle, since you brought it up uh, and also because it's next on our agenda, um, this, I wanted to discuss engaging another fundraising company for the bulk of the school year. The, I think the May poll fundraiser was a great. I hope that becomes a tradition um, at the end of the year. Um, but I think we need something on the way to that to help us raise money all year long. Um, so I know you circulated a few different options. For, was it three or four different options? We had three. Three. Yeah, so we went with one, which, so we'd still have two others. Um, personally, I am pretty interested in hearing what Melissa Sutton has to say. Um, it, I think her company is Abundance Journey, just because I know that for other charter schools, she's had success in raising six-figure donations uh, over a matter of time. But I think we need um, a better grasp of 
what exactly she would be doing for us before we said, yeah, let's engage her for a six month project, I think was her initial proposal. So and based okay. on the one we just did, it would be a much more effective and efficient if it was school wide where we did have teacher and parent council collaboration, that would just be ideal. Yeah. And starting now. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we could, could you check with her, Danielle? Did you have a direct contact with her? Yes. Could you follow up with her and see if she's available for our next board meeting on June 16th? Yes. And I, I think that will give us a, a window into you know, what exactly she could offer. And then we'll all hear it firsthand. And we can ask questions and see if it's something we want to move forward with. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, any other thoughts on fundraising for the school year? Um, any other leads on specific fundraisers that people think would be a, a good idea? It would be nice to request someone to edit some of the footage we have if we'd actually like to do social media plugs or advertisements for lack of a better description. Um, we've got really nice footage of campus and we can do some voiceover or um, tour like if we wanted to break it down into shorter segments or keep it a, a full length a walkthrough video. Nelly, is that something you potentially your family could help with? <laughs> I I can check with Larry. I know that he um, did a 360 of the whole campus. Um, I can check with him re in regards to his skills of underlaying. I know Frank was thinking of, you know, the animal sounds that are on campus and all of that. So I, I can talk to him and see what his scope is. What other footage do we have that you would want to use? Um, were you, did you participate by chance in the Maple replay? No, you were soccer. You were coaching. So at the very end of the video, there's about a three minute segment of, um, with the school verse and sound and footage of the walkthrough with camp on through campus. And there's only early grade um, artwork, but it would be nice to put in some main lesson books in there. That's about the only, and then of course, maybe some uh, some scripts or voiceover we can add to that. And if it's on the website, we can ask schools to share that or feature it or develop that in some fashion. I'll look into it and see what we can do. And okay, see what I can, can and put I'll together. share that. I'll share that file with you separately. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. All right. I'm done with my to-do list. <laughs> um, Next. I, sorry, I just wanted to share an idea that's been swirling around forever that I've approached various people about and just have gotten radio <laughs> silence on it. Um, and I don't know if it's just that people don't care and they're like, go ahead, or if they're not interested. Um, but I see no reason why we shouldn't be selling um, hats and bumper stickers and shirts and mugs with our new pretty logo. Um, if no one has any objections to that, I would love to start looking into that. I, I think it's awesome to, to have those things. And I think it's a quick, um, you know, moneymaker that we could have in office. Maybe they could be purchased online. We could bring them out at Winter Fair and any other events and festivals. Um you know, even even those the vinyl stickers that you can put on your, you know, hydro flask or whatever that just say desert marigold. Um, I think that would be awesome to have. So I'm, I'm happy to look into that and get that started if no one has any objections. Oh, that's a fantastic idea. Just in the past, it's been like a class fundraiser. So it would be nice to make uh, define those rules on if it's going to be certain classes that are doing that or certain items. So I know we did them. Um, for the sports teams, we had the sweatshirts, the caps and tank tops and V-necks um, yeah. to support the and, sports. And that was like and the Firebird. That was the Firebird logo. And then eighth grade traditionally has done the T-shirt. Yeah, they've done shirts. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just check in with like, um, you know, Frank and the LDC just to see what specifically they're, you know, okay with me getting started on. And then I can look into some companies. Yes. And, um, that, that can also, I just want to say that that can also be as easy as just having a few pieces of merchandise to push, but then we could just back, we could put all of our images onto a print shop that people just order from there directly. And yeah. So we don't have to deal with storing t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, mugs, all that stuff. Um, and I found that those work best if we were to make an order form out and put them into book bags and send them home. I think that a lot of a lot of would come a lot of orders would come off of that. And we used to have a school store. If we can do that in an online yeah. format as well, where we're not having to house inventory or have somebody man it, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Well, if anyone has any other ideas and they want to send them my way, or if you know of companies that, you know, you've had, you know, good, um, good experiences with, feel free to share them with me. I'm starting with just an idea. So <laughs> any ideas you have, feel free to share. I would just love to get it kind of up and running over the summer so people can buy stuff as they come to the school. I just have anyone... to, was our school store on campus? Yes. Yes. It was a small section of the office and then it was put out daily on the front porch and then it kind of dwindled down to just the office and then eliminated because we just didn't have the manpower to continue it. Okay, because I know that there is a parent that does have a Waldorf inspired store and studio in Phoenix that I hope that we can link things with her Um there was an idea that I had. I, I don't know if it's, it's probably not board related and probably more parent council related, but I saw kids walking out of school one day with a scholastic book order form. And I think that it would be better for us if we linked up with the store and did a book order form um, where the, we would be ordering our books through there of more Waldorf inspired books rather than scholastic books. And you know, that's always just a fun thing to for the kid to get that order form. And hopefully then we can also order books off of that to build in if we wanted to put stuff back on campus that parents could buy. And we've had authors come to the school and do their book reads as well for the, um, what was it, Dragon, Dragon Boy series. Yeah, these are all good ideas. Um, so, yeah, let's keep running with this and see where we can get going. Um, and I think the getting a, a Waldorf inspired book order form potentially uh, is a great idea. And um, I don't know what the specific benefits of the scholastic books are. I, that, that may have some benefits to the classroom teacher in terms of getting other materials and supplies. So I think that we should look into that before we say cancel it. Um, but I don't think there's a reason why you couldn't do both either, you know, but I think there's, yeah, at least in my house, we can never have enough books. So <laughs> I, I would welcome the opportunity for more, op more options. I have an, uh, an idea that's been kind of uh, rumbling around in my mind as well. And it's something that we used to do, but I don't think it was priced appropriately. And that summer camps. Um, I've been researching other Waldorf schools, you know, across the country, and they all seem to be doing some version of summer camp. Some of them are like doing four sessions and it's $750 a kid. So I signed my kids up for it to go see what it's like in upstate New York. But I wonder if that's not something that we might be able to consider, maybe not for this year as it's kind of short notice, but you know, could we pull off some kind of a, a summer camp? And it's, you know, obviously it's, you know, not maybe price appropriate for everyone, but it's a, an optional sort of a, you know, service that we could provide. So I thought I'd, I'd just raise that as an idea. I've yeah. even talked to um, Ms. Schmidt and Madame who wanted to do, uh, well, they're traditionally six days was their school week was six days, Monday through Saturday for the Saturn day of Saturday. And um, that was their paint day and handwork day. So that could be something if, if anyone's open, if LDC or faculty is open to something on a, on a Saturday, even as well during the school year or summer. 
Yeah, I, I think we're too late this year, especially with all the other things we have going on at the school mm-hmm. this summer, between the contemplation exercise and the teacher training, and to try and take on a, another thing going on on campus. But it would be awesome to start working on it for next year. And by the time summer rolls around next year to have a plan for that kind of offering, that would be, you know, well-planned and enriching. And, you know, we would know how to staff it and all the, you know, where would we put these kids in a 110 degree heat? All, all, all of the issues we have to figure out. So um, Kirsten, if you want to take the lead on, you know, starting to look into details on that and figuring out what it would take and what your kids experience is at this camp and what kind of offering it might be. That would be wonderful. Happy to. And if anybody has any other ideas or past experiences of when we used to do a camp, um, you know, please let me know. Still have all our programs, the pamphlets. (laughs) Perfect. All right. First, I'd be happy to give you feedback on that um, away from this meeting. Perfect. I'll reach out to you, Mr. Tanner, and find a good time if that's all right. Thank you, ma'am. Great. Good ideas and good discussion now. Thanks, everyone. Uh, all right. So next on our budget agenda, we have the proposed 301 plan for the next school year uh, that Mr. Marizio circulated to us. Uh, let's see if I can pull that up, shared screen, so we can take a look at it together. Let's Everybody seeing that now? Seeing Kirsten nodding. Okay. All right. So, Frank, do you want to walk us through anything we need to take a look at here specifically on this plan? Sure, sure. Um, well, there is the state does require that you meet certain um, requirements to get the 301. It just is not automatic like it was 10 years ago. Um, You have to do some things. Number one, are you a teacher in good standing or is your contract being terminated at the end of the year? Are you being released and not renewed? Um, Did you submit your lesson plans? Are are you prepared to teach? Do you have SMART goals that you're setting um, for the year and are you achieving those goals? Um, Do you uh, teach at least, I want to say that's over half time, um, which is appropriate. Uh, It's very similar to how you qualify for health insurance. You have to be 30 hour type employee or larger that that determines you to be a full time employee. This is the same thing. A teacher who just teach two two classes is not eligible for 301 money. the teachers all fill this out before, I think there's a date of April 16th or something like that. I could be wrong. It's around April. Then the committee and I sit down and go over each of these. You can scroll down a little bit more. There's a certain amount of points that you have to get to be eligible. I will tell you that first one, 33 points, you'll see that is in there. <clears throat> because the state canceled growth after the end of last year and through this year because of COVID. And so what we did was give that automatically until the state lifts that because we didn't want to punish anyone for the COVID situation. But normally uh, the letter grade of the school, a- each teacher is part of that because they're a part of student achievement and student learning. 
And so this year you see the 33 is in there already because that had been waived. And then you have to get to 100 points. So you're looking for 67 additional points. And those are all at the items below, which you can scroll through. We give a lot of points uh, for being highly qualified, for being a board member, for serving on our many activities like Winter Fair, uh, all of the fest festivals that we put on. If you are part of uh, a sponsorship of a play or a musical or coaching, or you can see all those parent council events, you get points for going to all that stuff because being bought in and participatory in the whole campus rewards you towards achieving the 301 money it really is about time and effort that you're putting in, not just academically, but for the social and emotional well-being of a child and for the overall school. You can keep going down. Again, lots of school-wide events that you get points for. As you can see, we have a lot of events, and we didn't get to do those this year. Many of those were out. So our teachers had to qualify by doing other things like college coursework, or some Waldorf online training. Uh, they'll get to do that with, our, with this summer's training. They'll get to count those 50 points for next year. Uh, external professional development, whether it's conferences and workshops and certs in, oh, we always have to renew our blood pathogen and our CPR and our first aid. Uh, serving on committees, you can see, and you can keep scrolling down a little bit. Um, being a committee chairperson gets you a little bit more. Um, going to sporting events, coaching sporting events. You can accumulate a lot of points. This year, I'm happy to say we had 14 people meet the qualifications. And this is for you to approve for next year. Um, as you know, it has to be approved by a board prior to the school year beginning. The 301 committee is very aware of that and made sure I got that to you uh, in time to approve before August 11th so that it's ready to, to be instated for at our teacher meetings. We'll go over this with everybody at the first week of school to explain to them, this is what 301 is, this is how you get it. As you know, most of our teachers know about this, but we're gonna have four or five or six new teachers next year that we wanna inform about this opportunity. Thank you. Um, that thorough description. Um, for our newer board members, the 301 money is essentially extra money from the state for teachers who are performing exceptionally well. But you have to come up with the criteria for establishing what that exceptionally well looks like. Um, and, and it has to apply evenly to everybody. Um, and so this is the criteria that comes up with that. And then for the teachers who meet it, then they become eligible to receive some extra compensation for that school. Can I clarify something for the new board members? Please. Um, this was voted on by the, uh, the citizens of Arizona. And it does, there are a couple things that people don't understand. This only goes to classroom teachers. Um, secretaries, administrators, counselors, school nurses, they do not get this. It goes to classroom teachers who are working with kids. Uh, so they have a roster with kids' names on it and grades are given. Um, some people don't like that, but that's how the state legislatures created 301 and what the people voted on was for that to happen. The other thing is, I can tell you, as I've been in a, uh, several districts now, this is very similar to what all other districts do. Uh, obviously, academics is a key piece. Being highly qualified is a key piece. Um, professional development to make you a better teacher is a key piece. Serving on committees and working with students in extracurricular, those are all normal for that I see in other districts. This is not some far left or far right plan. I just want to make sure you all understand this is the norm. This is what I'm seeing around the state. Any questions about the 301 plan? Nice. 
radio silence. Okay. Well, that being the case, I will move to approve the 301 plan for the 2021 to 2022 school year as presented here this evening. Second. Thank you, Dan. Further discussion? Did I miss, is there a grand total number that's needed to meet that? Or is there a percentage based on the points earned? A hundred points. Okay. And how does our staff feel about this form? Um, they vote on it. And so they approve it. That's, so they've done that's that normal. already? Yes. Yes. Okay. That, that was done um, years ago to set it in motion. Um, of course, some staff, I won't, I won't ignore the fact that there are some staff, just like there are some people who voted for it in the public, believe it should go to every school employee, but that's not the way it was set up by the original vote and the legislature that put this out. Um, it only goes to classroom teachers. I guess at some point in our existence, we did it differently, and that was not following the criteria of the state. And so I wanna say that's one of the reasons the 301 committee formed on our campus was to make sure we followed that because if you get audited and you're not following it, they can take it away. And it's a lot more money than just what goes, this is for the bonus part. That's only 40% of the entire pot of money that comes to you. The other 60% can be used on supplies, to reduce class size, um, to, to buy classroom aids, some other things like that. But the 40% bonus money goes only to classroom teachers. And there are some stringent rules laid out that we really should follow. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Any other questions or discussion on this topic? All right. All those in favor? Uh, okay. Uh, abstaining? Okay. So that is six to six in favor, one abstaining, uh, and one opposed. The motion will carry. Thank you all. Back to our agenda. Let's see. Ah, capital improvement projects. So, Frank, you mentioned there's a fence, um, but I also wanted to talk about the priority of some of the projects. I know you sent over uh, four or five different things that you'd like to see happen. And we now have. Uh, ESSER funds that we can use for capital improvement projects. Um, so what are, at the fence is one, what, what in your view, Frank, are the priority of the projects that you propose? Well, I, I think the fence and the wood shop are a pretty big deal. The, having the students work in that wood shop without heat or air just isn't right. <laughs> we, we need to do something there. Um, I had another bid this week that I have not sent you yet that instead of remodeling the current wood shop, because we found that price to be pretty high, I found a place that builds uh, workshops and puts it on a pad and then I just have to hire a contract to put air conditioning and power in it. And I think that's going to come in way under what I shared with the board members early on. Um, so I'm working on that right now. I think that's a second priority. I think the adult bathrooms at the far end of the campus are a third priority. And uh, Willamaine Corporation is supposed to get me final numbers on that this week. And they're going to replace the air conditioner, which is actually a low cost item in that workshop or work room for the high school, that small little art building, because the air and the heat really doesn't work in there very well. It's just a little window unit. 
And so they're going to put some insulation in there and put a, a commercial unit in there. Uh, those are the top four. Look, I would love to say, let's go for it on the uh, multi-purpose room, but we're not even close to having that kind of money. It's a million eight to do that building. Mm -hmm. We have to really put our heads together to figure out, because I do believe that is a really important project, but we have to find a way. Uh, I even have, uh, we've been looking at grants from the JJ Watt Foundation, from Ira Fulton, and both of those big foundations work with schools, but they only will do it for Title I qualified schools. And we are not a Title I school, and I don't believe we would qualify for Title I monies. And those are some of the rules that those organizations have set up. Um, I do have Bonnie in the front office checking weekly to see if there's a new grant out there, because we that is a dream. Everybody wants that building. It's just really high. Um, I do want to add our conversation today, that fence along the high school. Those of you who have driven past that morning after morning, you can see that it's almost falling over. I don't like that, number one, it's four and a half feet and people could just get to our kids without much effort and that it could fall over any day. And so I have Steve pricing an actual, like what you see in, in how housing developments, a block wall that we can stucco and paint with a double wide gate that we open in the morning that we would allow fire truck access or even delivery access for that matter. Um, he's pricing that this week. Um, I do think we need to do something there. I don't think it's going to cost more than 15,000. And so we would have that. And I'm not talking going all the way from the high school down to the student parking lot. I'm talking about just right in front of the high school. It, it's just, it doesn't look nice and it's not safe. I just would like to put a, a, a nice pretty barrier between our kids who sit in that yard and eat lunch and, and hang out on their breaks. And they're in full view of anyone passing by. And I just would like to change that, so. And Frank, you mentioned the title one that's based on the lunch forms that many families don't turn in, correct? That is correct. Is there a percentage of the forms that are turned in? Would it help if we promoted and encouraged our yeah. classes? Yes, and I'm going to do that in the fall. A, Believe it or not, those come into the state in December for the next year. So I, I, I saw gonna, that. Excuse me, Frank. I saw that for SR3 funds, we would have gotten two and a half times the amount of money had we been a Title I school. Yep. Um, so I am going to make a big plea to our parents. First of all, it needs to be explained to them because it's on a, a, a re reduced, a reduced lunch. lunch. They think this doesn't mean anything because we don't serve lunch. And so I have to go into an explanation of, well, wait a minute, don't throw this away. I know we don't have lunch but this is how we qualify for other programs around the state. Um, like tutors and aides for academics. We can get those through Title I monies that we're not even close to uh, qualifying for because I would say 70% of our parents throw that form away because they know we don't have free, we don't have lunch. So I have to do a much better job of explaining that and I will do that in the fall and make a big push to get that all in in December. Um, another example, we could get a full-time social emotional counselor because of the rise in issues with children in the last two years in the state of Arizona. Um, qualifying for that would allow us, that's a full salaried employee helping our kids on a daily basis. I would really love to do that. Um, so uh, there are there are lots of ways we can use that money if I can get our parents to fill that out appropriately. And so with all of the ESSER funds that we have, what is our total pool of money for capital improvement projects right now? Um, okay, I got to think about this. We're 142, 240. No, it's going to be higher than that because we just got ESSER 3 
and it's higher than the 150, it's 175 plus the uh, 105 left. So 280 is about what we're going to have. Um, and uh, the, the projects I named for you, Gregory, all of them fit under that with the exception of the farmhouse being torn down and rebuilt. That's a big project. That's a million two. And the multi-purpose room is a million eight, I believe. And by the way, those numbers are probably low now because those numbers were given to me before all these prices got jacked up in the last three months, how wood and steel have just gone through the roof. Um, I'm seeing some things double in price, which is very odd, but it is what it is. And I, I can't tell them, but you gave me this price six months ago. It doesn't work that way. Um, but all those other projects fit under that with leaving some left over. As you know, I need to worry about air conditioning units. Steve and I walked today and we have a couple of units that are kind of on the brink. And so I'd like to have a little bit of cushion there in case something turns bad because you have to have air conditioning, as you know, and those units are 14 or 15,000 each. Um, so I, I would like a little bit of cushion on that for those emergency type things. Got it. So, and then the fence project is the one we specifically have quotes for that we could consider tonight. Um, and it, the quotes other than price look to me basically identical um, in terms of what they were actually going to be doing. I, is there any reason why we wouldn't just go with the cheaper option? Well, Dan just sent me something. Um, he thinks he might know a company called Allied Industries that could come in lower and it's significantly lower. And so I would like to at least investigate that this week and see if I can find that they are significantly lower. Unfortunately, I don't want to wait two weeks. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to ask are you allowed to approve one and me not move forward until I get an answer on this? Because if it really is 10,000 lower, I would say we would want to do that. Um, if they then come in and say, no, our prices got jacked up too, and it's 24,000, then we could go with the one you approve. Remember, just because you approve it tonight doesn't mean I have to move forward on it yet. It just means I can't use someone else yet. <laughs> right, right. So, and I think the thing to do then is to not approve a specific invoice, but to approve the expense up to a certain amount for the purpose of. Uh, would that be more of we will approve up to 21000 because that's the low bid you have in front of you? So, if I have a lower bid, we can go with that company. Is that how that works? Yeah, yeah. We, we can approve giving you the authority to do that. Um, I don't see any reason why we couldn't. And I think you're on the ground and you're talking to the contractor, so you're gonna know, you know, if there's a you know price difference of a thousand dollars between one, you know, you're gonna know which is the better contractor. Do we already know the composition and what materials this fence is constructed of? It's a, like a vinyl, uh, it's synthetic, so the, it's weatherproof. Um, rain won't make it chip or splinter. Um, they, they are replaceable in sections. Say a car ran into one, then you would just replace a section of it. Um, it's not heavy. Um, obviously a car hitting it would, would break it, but it would break <laughs> the wood fence too. So. Um, I don't want to see that happen. The actual uh, posts are heavier because they'll because there's posts in the ground and those will hold the, the weight of the slats going horizontally. And of course, we have several areas for gates that we would put in because we enter the campus at different places. Um, we enter by the garden, we enter by the garage or the barn where we have to have 
the trucks uh, and the, the I'm trying to think of that heavy equipment that Steve and, and Hector use. We enter by the bridge. Uh, we, when we use the meadow where we have the graduations, we enter by the end of that fence now. So we would have a double gate there. So we would have several ways for people to en enter. Gates cost more, of course, than just the fencing. Um, but it's not significant. I have, I have no issue saying four or five gates are fine. I mean, we don't have to have just two because it costs a little more. We really need those areas of entrance. So, so we have uh, two quotes. One is for eighteen thousand seven hundred twenty-eight. Another one is for. 23,976 and potentially you'll get a third quote from somebody who might come in lower than that. So if we approve the expense up to 24,000, that would be the leeway that you would need, I think, to figure out which is the best contractor. Um, you know, it would be great to go with something cheaper, but I don't want to sacrifice quality in the name of just getting the cheapest price because this is the face of the school and um, it's also you know something that we want to be durable and last and, um, something that kids who are in very you know inevitably going to be climbing all over it um, at various points in the school's life you know it needs to be able to withstand that kind of wear and tear so does anyone, before I make a motion, what are people's thoughts on improving the expense up to twenty four thousand? Using that, I have a, I have a question. Um, we have vinyl fencing at our house. You might see it there in the background, that white area, <laughs> and it's not very durable. I guess I've been a little disappointed in how well it's like. It's bowed a bit when we had the pool put in. It got melted by the exhaust. I mean, we've had some durability issues with it. I don't know. I mean, these are like big sheets, so it may be different. But I don't know if if the um, the contractors that you've bid it, bid it out with have have spoken to the just the the structural integrity of it at all. Kristen, what you're describing th those sheets is a totally different style fence. Um, picture if you drive by uh, farms with horses. Yeah, I, I, I saw the, the pictures. Thank you. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if that, so that helped lighter, make them a bit more durable. That does because there isn't that much weight behind them. And there's a post every four feet. So it keeps, I know you can't see my hands. It keeps them straight. So there's a pole in the middle so they don't sag. Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously the Arizona heat beats everything up. Um, and I asked those type of questions because I said, oh, they're not metal. And they said, no, you, you don't want metal because it'll rust. You don't want wood because it'll then splinter and the rain will destroy it. And you'll have to continually paint it or you'll have to continually uh, stain it. This is the new way to do it. Um, and I don't know if you have horse properties near you and you've seen this. Um, I actually live behind some horse properties and went to that guy's yard watching him put it up and said, tell me about this. Because <laughs> he just put a new one up and he explained it all to me. So I, I was very comfortable that this should last 10 years, 12 years, which is significant. Great. Yeah, absolutely. A, a wood picket fence won't last that way. Uh, when I look at our wood fence, which I love, is charming, but it is so beat up. A, a fourth grader could knock that over with me. Wood picket fences have a typical lifespan of, of max like ten years ish before they start really showing their age. Yeah. Um, the the vinyl the vinyl ones can last up to twenty uh, concrete blocks, almost forty years or longer. Uh, the vinyl, a lot of times, depending on how the thickness of it and it's like the stuff that's made out of recycled materials, actually is really durable and lasts a really long time, even though you pay a premium for it. Great, thank you. Question person. Uh, other thoughts? All right. Well, 
Well, that being said, because we have this funds in the form of the the, the ESSER money that we're getting that we can use for capital improvement, um, I will move to approve uh, the expense of uh, the fence for the front of the school up to twenty-four thousand uh, dollars at the discretion of Mr. Marizio choosing the best qualified contractor with the highest quality materials. Second. Thank you, Dan. Just waiting for April to catch up. Right. She's ready. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? All right. All those in favor? All right. Opposed? Abstaining? Danielle, I didn't catch your vote. I'm undecided, but yes, yes. So in favor, then? In favor. Okay. All right. So it's unanimous, then, in favor. The motion carries. All right. Uh, so that takes us back to Frank. Uh, any uh, news about the end of the school year um, that we should know about other than what's in your report, of course? Um, and then also uh, any more updates about the survey that went out to families regarding their intentions for next year and their feelings on you know, hybrid model education versus um, just the, the traditional model we've always done. You bet. Um I did not check today on that survey. I checked on Friday was the last time. And we were under 10 families that said, I want to stay online out of, I want to say, 140 families responded. So it's not all families yet. Um, but of the ones who responded, it was pretty significant that they want to be in person. Uh, less than 10 wanted online. Um, things to report. Obviously, those of you who were able to attend eighth grade uh, promotion was wonderful. High school graduation was wonderful. Uh, I want to give kudos to the students in their speeches. They're always the best part. Eighth graders as well. Um, we tend to think of them as being too young to do that. That's just not true. They did an outstanding job in addressing the crowd. The high school students were also awesome. And our staff members who spoke were eloquent and to the point, and they're always the best part of those events. Uh, they were a full house in both circumstances. Special thank you to Colleen Pope as she made those wonderful cupcakes and everybody raved about them, uh, and including my family because I got to bring about five of them home. <laughs> and it was outstanding. Special thank you to Steve and Hector, who moved 50 chairs and 30 benches five times in two days because <laughs> it went from the early childhood patio to the, the grassy knoll, back to the early child patio, <laughs> back to the, it just kept moving because the events, you know, I left out some events like um, the rose ceremony. That was the first time I've done that. That was outstanding. The tea party that the younger grades do, that was outstanding. Um, the rainbow bridge with the kindergarten. Wow, that was truly special too. Um, we really know how to do closing year activities and one was better than another and lots of parents got to come see all different ages of kids. And it was just a really special last two days. It went very, very well. I'm happy to report that. Thank you. I'd like to add just a couple of things. Thanks, Franks, for taking my leftovers. That's why I didn't. <laughs> um, this was my first experience seeing graduations on campus. And I want to say that it was just gorgeous to have the landscape be the backdrop. It was elegant. It was intimate. Everyone was able to see and 
be, you know, outdoors. The weather cooperated. We had a light breeze. And both ceremonies were just so heartfelt, outstanding. I thank you to everyone who, who helped put that on and participate. Any other questions for Frank about the end of the school year or the ceremonies that took place? I have a question regarding the open positions and what the progress is on finding Waldorf trained teachers. I feel that it's really important that we have, um, especially a Waldorf teacher, definitely taking on the first grade since it's so big. Um, what's the progress on that, Frank? I am happy to report that we have an interview tomorrow. Um, John is actually on that committee with me. And this lady uh, answered an ad in our Waldorf today. She is a full, full-time full Waldorf trained teacher from a school in Pennsylvania. And she reached out to me and I said, oh, but you're in Pennsylvania. She said, it's time for a change. <laughs> so she would look to relocate to Arizona and we'll see how this interview goes tomorrow. Um, I'm just tickled pink that we have a Waldorf person who's uh, thrown her name in the hat. She has about 10 years experience and we will do that interview at 1.30 tomorrow. Let's cross our fingers on that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have one other question. If we, if, if the survey comes back and you have 10 students or families that want to be hybrid, does that mean that we are honoring that or is that still up for discussion or what's your process on that? That's our next agenda item to figure out what we're going to do about that, Nellie. So, and I think that that's a good transition to move into it. So the originally uh, in just typical COVID fashion, this landscape shifted literally under our feet as we were starting to think about it. So originally the governor said, you cannot offer hybrid next year unless you were authorized to offer online education prior to COVID, essentially. Um, then the legislature said, wait a minute, actually we do want that to be allowed. So we're going to authorize that uh, schools are able to do that if um, they meet certain criteria. And those criteria are, uh, it, it's things we could meet. It's like holding public hearings on it and then making a decision to permit hybrid learning for the fall uh, or for the next school year. So it's, it's not insurmountable. Um, the question is, you know, do we have the resources to continue to do it? Um, and do we want to do it when we're no longer required to do it? Uh, because although we have the option to do it, the legal requirement that we were under over this past year to offer hybrid education for uh, at, at least hybrid education for the entire school year, that expired at the end of this school year. So, Board members, your thoughts on, uh, based on our survey results where we have less than 10 families saying, I want to be online only, you know, how, how should we proceed? Is there any information on why they want to be online only after the vaccines are rolled out and generally everyone's, like, I don't, I don't get it. Does, do we have any insights into that? Like, did, was, it, was there any more information? No? We did not ask why you're voting that way. Yeah, that makes sense. If we decide to do hybrid, I would not want to roll it out the same way. I would not want our teachers to have to do both. If we had maybe one person dedicated to that or pre-recorded content for those students, I, I just don't want to see our teachers have to do so much more on top of what they bring to the classroom. A crazy amount of extra work. Yeah, and we've, we've seen the struggle all year long trying to essentially do two jobs at the same time. Um, and, and I don't, 
Frank will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we have extra people to just do an online only portion or we don't have, I don't think we can fairly ask our teachers to pre work or, you know, or whether it's correspondence or whether it's some type of packet sent home, just something where the a teacher doesn't have to do both. Yeah. Is it po is it possible that some of the families that are staying home is because they're choosing to not have their children wear masks? And then if our mask mandate changes for September, would that number possibly change? We did not ask that question in the survey. We asked simply, do you, if in the fall, are you hoping to come back or planning to come back in person? or wanting to stay online? There was a question in the survey that said, um, would you want your child wearing a mask for the next school year? There yes, was something. But it wasn't based on, it wasn't asking, is your decision based on wearing a mask or not wearing a mask? Well, I added that in my comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> a point was raised also by a faculty member that, that emailed us about it not being um, pedagogically appropriate to do hybrid learning given that we're, you know, Waldorf based. And I thought that was an interesting argument. It kind of takes the mask wearing, no mask wearing vaccination question off the table. And I, I thought it kind of boiled it down to more of a, um, a really core question of, Regardless of COVID, is this something, is this a direction we want to go as a school? So I just thought I'd, I'd toss that idea in in case anyone hadn't, hadn't read that. I was completely shocked we went hybrid in the first place. Desperate times, right? It's been a hard year. Well, yeah, I mean, we were legally required to go hybrid. So. I mean, again, just without <laughs> looking at other modes or alternatives. Alternatives. It was just that was just shocking to me. I, I have to echo what Kirsten said. I think it would be nice to come back to looking at what the core principles are in Waldorf and and having the media aspect rethought in regards to the classrooms. I'm not sure I'm following you there, Nelly. It, the media the use of technology. The use of having the computers removed out of the classroom. Well, if it's just ten families, could we reach out by phone to those ten families and instead of sending another school wide survey, just reach out to those ten families? Is it the mask or is there something else? Or do we again want to just make a decision based on the majority? I was gonna suggest that. We give these families a little bit of time, maybe the week we get back in July after 4th of July. And then I check again to see, is it under 10 again? Or is it more than 10? And I set up a meeting for them to come in and sit with me and say, okay, what questions do you have? How can I alleviate your fears? Is there any way to move your needle or is this a... a there's nothing I can say to help you in this situation, but at least reach out and have a kind conversation of, look, it matters that you stay here. We want you to stay here. Talk to me a little bit and let's see what comes of that conversation. I, I like the idea of having that conversation, but I don't think it's feasible to delay our decision on this until mid-July. And oh, no, I didn't mean to delay the decision. I just meant as the summer goes on, they may start to feel differently. If all goes well in America, the way we see the numbers going now, obviously, if something changes, we're all punting and we don't know what we're going to do. Um, yeah. But we like how the numbers are going now. And maybe these families could start to see that and it could change their mind. Remember, they could, you could put your decision out and in f four weeks, I can offer a, a fig leaf to say, come sit with me. What else can I do that we're doing this? 
But I want to try and assure you we're going to do it safely. Uh, we do care about your kids. We want everyone back. Talk to me before they enroll somewhere else or before school starts is my point, because they could always drop out and re-enroll before school starts. Um, I just would want to try and keep them is my point. April, you look like you've been about to say something. That yeah. <laughs> Everyone keeps talking for keeping me with you. No, it's great. It's a really good discussion. I'm, I'm glad that we're all just throwing out ideas of, you know, what about this? What about this? Um, I have a feeling that most parents have already made their decisions. Um, maybe even, you know, are already signed up for other schools. I've done that many times where I've been enrolled at, you know, had my kids enrolled at two schools over the summer. And then you just tell the school that you don't want, I'm sorry, cancel my enrollment. This happens all the time. Parents everywhere do this. Um, so I imagine those who have, um, you know, very specific reasons for not feeling comfortable being on campus. Maybe their their child who is, you know, under 12 and cannot yet be vaccinated is high risk and they don't feel comfortable coming to school until their child can be vaccinated. Um, you know, for a family in a situation like that, I, I would imagine they're not coming to campus, um, you know, until their child can be vaccinated. But having said that, I would love to... Um, I want to see some compassion for these families. Um, th th they don't choose their child's immunity. They don't choose their, um, you know, biology and health of themselves or maybe grandparents living in the home. You know, th these are just facts. These are scientific facts of what is happening right now. So I, I would love to um, maybe have those families who have opted out for, for those reasons to be, you know, moved up on the wait list so that if if something happens and they can now get vaccinated or their circumstances have changed, that they have an opportunity to come back to our school, you know, so they don't lose their place. Um, I know for me, I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't want to lose my place. It's it's difficult to think about those parents who are having to make those decisions when they you know, it stinks. It stinks. People who are here want to be here for all the right reasons. And this is just an abnormal thing that is happening to us. And so I would love for us to reach out with compassion and have some sort of a plan um, to help these families and to, I guess, offer them an olive branch and make sure that they're cared for. Um, because I think we've all learned this year that you know, hybrid's not great. Being online is not great. It's it's not best for students. We all know that. Um, and as Waldorf parents and faculty and staff, we all want kids to be on campus. We know that that's best for everybody. But in these weird circumstances, it might not be possible right now for certain families. So I don't know, something to think about. I, I really want to take care of our, our families and our students and have some compassion, think about them. Mr. Tanner, what are your thoughts? I really appreciate the conversation that the board has uh, engaged itself in. Uh, most of the points have been spoken. Um, hybrid is a greatly flawed educational model. It's also a system that is greatly abused. Uh, a lot of kids are in and out. It's hard to track them. Parents go on vacations and uh, show up from various uh, loc locations uh, with their children online, uh, which is all well and good, but it's very difficult to maintain educational standards uh, with that going on. Uh, I agree with April. I would like to see compassion for, uh, for those students that are, have circumstances that are well out of their control if there was a way that we could uh put them higher on the list or, or some some way i don't know i'm sure mr marizio would have many ideas on how that might work um i i i, I do want to i do i do want to 
do recognize that. And I appreciate April for, for bringing that to, to my consciousness because it, it wasn't there. So I'm grateful for that. So that's pretty much it, Mr. Schneider. I, I think it's very difficult on the teachers. Uh, we don't have a, um, uh, if we, it, and I, as someone, I think it might've been Kirsten brought this up. Uh, the educational models may be to maybe changing in the future in terms of online and online options, or maybe that was Nelly. Forgive me if I, if, if I misidentified uh, one of the board members, uh, especially in high school, uh, there, there may be some kind of an option for online there. Uh, it's a little out of my, my realm of expertise, the high school, but, um, it's it's possible there we may be looking at some sort of online option uh, as we move forward. So I don't know that we're shutting the door to online completely, but but it is very difficult to maintain in in the classroom as a teacher and for the students. So that's that's what I can say, and I I appreciate your um, your considering this matter. It's uh, it's something that 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 we have to uh, make a statement on, so that the teachers can be secure. How that th how where they're headed in August, what their what their demands are going to look like, and so that the parents can also make the decisions that are that are best for their for their families. Thank you for sharing that. So, I mean, my thought at this point, and anyone is free to make a motion differently, but my thought is that we not pursue hybrid education for the fall, given, given it's roughly 7% of our survey responses said that they would make a different decision uh, if online is not available. Um, but that said, April raises a great point, but I think we should specifically reach out to those families that we know about and see what their specific situation is and see what we can do to accommodate their concerns, um, their fears, if there's any you know, arrangement that we can make that will you know, alleviate their concerns or if there's some type of specific in-classroom accommodation we could make that would, you know, help them through this process. Because uh, like April said, we don't want to send the message that we're abandoning anyone, but we do have to make a decision that's the best for the school. And then, you know, I think the teachers have um, been running double time for almost 18 months. I think in all fairness to them, we need to move back to the educational model that our school was founded to give. Um, and I think we need to uh, you know, move past this unusual era uh, and get back to what we know how to do best. Yes, Gregory, sir. a question. The vote or the decision the board is making tonight, this is purely about hybrid, not if the state shuts down and everybody has to go to totally online, that's a totally different topic for a different time if that happened, correct? A absolutely. I mean, and that is not, that would not be our decision at all. That, that would be the state saying, you've got to do it. And, and of course, we would follow that directly. Um, so, and, and it's different also than, uh, the, the, where, the weird situation we were in for most of the last school year where the state said you can you know pick your educational model based on your reading of the, the data that we had which was the you know worst possible choose your own adventure story I've ever lived through um, so you know the, these are it's totally different than this is just purely whether or not we want to offer hybrid um, when it's not required and uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm 
open to other thoughts, but that's my take on our discussion and um, the survey responses that we've gotten so far. All right, well, hearing nothing else, uh, I think that there's nothing for us to vote on. We would have to vote to initiate this process of holding public hearings if we wanted to pursue hybrid, but not wanting to pursue it. I don't think we need to take any action, um, but I would say, uh, you know, Frank, we would ask that you, when you feel it's appropriate, reach out to those families and see if you can figure out uh, what's going on with them and what we can do to help. All right. Brings us to our last uh, category this evening. Uh, so first up, uh, these are board matters. So let's uh, approve the meeting minutes of our last meeting. Uh, so I will move to approve the minutes of the May 19th, 2021 meeting. Second. Thank you, Danielle. Any discussion? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Motion carries. All right. Um, April, you circulated a board education plan. Uh, and this is based on uh, a discussion we had previously about potentially, you know, sharing ideas. Have people had a chance to look at that? Any thoughts on that? That was a few meetings ago, so I'm not sure that our newly voted in members have, All right. well, have even seen that. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So why don't we table this discussion until our new members have had a chance to look at it so we can have a meaningful one. And April, if you could recirculate that. Um, yeah. Then we'll pick it up next time. Uh, all right. So last up then, I just wanted to touch base on what everyone's working on. Um, I, I know that over the course of the last few months, I've, you know, we've tried to pick things that people are working on, including this evening. Um, so if there's something that you are, that you haven't processed, but it's not finished yet, if you could just let us know where it is. So we can, uh, give a heads up on what's going on. So, uh, all right. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're all kind of uh, at a wall. Other than was that a, was that a <laughs> working question? on audit stuff for Deb. Yeah. Okay. Those, those are my projects, compiling all the minutes, making sure they're in the right files. Getting, I got all the board information together. So I've been working with Deb on that. I can summarize my tasks from today's meeting. <laughs> I <I'm gonna laughs> no need to do that. Um, re researching the tax credits and all the ins and outs for all the tracking questions that Ms. Deb and other parents and families have. Uh, scheduling Melissa for June 16th. Sending Nellie the video for the Maypole doing a tour segment. I think there was a number four, but I'll have to come back to that. Five, send info to April for merchandise ideas or companies we've used. Uh, six, send um, Kirsten the summer camp pamphlets. And, um, and then the other one was just a question for Frank. Does anybody remember number four? No, but I just have a question, Danielle. How long would you like uh, the edited video to be? I think we should discuss that. So let's... Um, Let's touch on that once you've had a chance to see it. Okay. I, I'm thinking variety, various different ones and we'll see what we come up with. Okay. Thank you. Well, and since Danielle only has six things she's working on that we gave her tonight, if anyone else has other things to, to give her to fill her time. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. That, that's uh, for doing all of that. Much appreciated. All right, so uh, for, on my end, I'm taking a look at the budget, 
um, in the background. I know Kirsten's looking at that too, along with Dan and Frank. Um, I uh, there. I am working on uh, updating the charter board with our new membership. Thank you, new board members, for giving me uh, the affidavits and other forms that I asked you to sign. I now have everything I need, I believe, to get that done. Um, and then I'm also working on uh, gathering a couple of things that we need to respond to our auditor uh, by the end of June. <laughs> I'm uh, reviewing the budget as well, combined, uh, well, not really combined, but, and then also uh, have some emails out and requests for some uh, science equipment. And I'm trying to follow up on that and get some stuff for the school. Uh, I'm also uh, trying to put together and push forward on the uh, form on the website that'll allow people to, uh, teacher, faculty to put in requests for things and the family, families and, and relatives and whoever in the community be able to donate to specific things and fill requests. And then I've also emailed the uh, five executive directors in Australian schools that have uh, Steiner streams built into them to ask start start a conversation around what information they can provide about how they have been able to implement Waldorf and a charter or there it's a public school system, but I'm trying to get ideas and stuff that we can bring back to the board around how you mix this public style of education with Waldorf. That's it for me. Excellent. Well, I mean, as, as we can all hear, we've been very busy uh, doing stuff on behalf of the board and Nellie and Kirsten, um, if there's anything um, that you haven't already volunteered to do tonight or been voluntold to do tonight, um, you know, please reach out. Um, Nellie, I owe you a phone call. I know. Um, sorry, we haven't been able to connect yet. Um, and we'll figure out uh, stuff for you to do because uh, there's plenty to work on, that's for sure. All right, and that uh, is the end of our agenda. So thank you everyone for being here. I will move to adjourn. I need a second or we can't go home. I'll second it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, all right, any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. All right, Nellie, if you could read the closing verse for us. The most important tasks for humankind today and in the future is that we should learn to live together and understand one another. If this human fellowship is not achieved, all talk of development is empty. Rudolf Steiner. Thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night.